Welcome to this Ask Me Anything. I used to release these both as audio versions on the podcast feed as well as video versions on the YouTube channel. Uh, if you're new to this because you're listening on the audio podcast feed, welcome. Uh, you can submit questions via my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash Dr. James Cook, uh, or by joining the YouTube channel membership community. That's at youtube.com forward slash Dr. James Cook. Uh, so the first question this week comes from Sam. Sam says, hi, James. I'm interested in understanding why depression might present in people who have no clear underlying causes, no past trauma, positive relationships, material stability, etc. Is there always an underlying cause? And what is the evolutionary purpose of feeling depression in this case? Uh, two, can you recommend any other YouTube channels or podcasts? So I'll do a question one first. Um, yeah, so in my experience, the almost a defining feature of depression is a sense of um, stuckness, a sense of not really understanding why you're depressed. So if you, if you're, you know, unemployed and you're struggling to make ends meet and you feel awful as a result, you might not describe that as depression. You might say that you're incredibly stressed and you're struggling and you feel incredibly down, um, and defeated by your circumstances. If a loved one has died, you might say you're grieving, but we tend to reserve depression when we talk about it clinically um, as a category where there doesn't seem to be a kind of an imminent reason for you to be depressed. Uh, it seems to be pathological in the sense that it, it's not serving any immediate function. It's not being kind of brought about as an immediate response to something. Now that's how we tend to think about it in our society that normalizes a lot of everyday traumas and emotional stresses and doesn't tend to delve into kind of inner work and looking into our deep history and see what kinds of what kind of models we might be carrying that might be leading us to to suffer mentally in the present even though the events may have happened decades ago instead of doing that kind of work we live in a system that wants to kind of get us back to work get us kind of being part of a, a productive system um and so there's this there's this emphasis on if you if you're no longer productive then that's when you're when you're depressed and if there's no immediate cause you know that's the um the category we're dealing with it's pathological because you can't immediately see where it's coming from in my experience um both with my own uh kind of depression in my 20s and then seeing in other people there's usually you know if you start doing inner work whether that's psychotherapy you know psychedelics or um just yeah well, spending time looking into your own mind and, and unpicking becoming aware of your own dynamics there's usually, I'm tempted to say always, a story to tell as to why you're in this state. Now, I suspect most of, that, most of the time that's going to be something that could be cast out psychotherapeutically. That's usually a good kind of model, especially if we go back to kind of childhood trauma and emotional stresses when we're young and when we felt overwhelmed. Um, and then how that can lead to, to kind of behaving in such a way that you're, you're living through coping mechanisms that are no longer serving you, that you might still be, you know, you may seem to have positive relationships, but you may be carrying um, unconscious uh, feelings of kind of lack of self-worth, for example, that, that are no longer relevant, but they're a hangover from childhood, say, you know, from like emotional neglect. These, these are very common dynamics. And you may have a, a, a kind of a good image of yourself. You may feel like you have good self-esteem, but there could be unconscious dynamics keeping you feeling a sense of disconnection and suffering as a result. Um, so my, my instinct is that there usually is some causal story to be told. I don't think it makes sense to say that things, it's not common for mental states to have just a, a kind of spontaneous physical cause. I'm not saying it's impossible. Um, you know, when people feel terrible after, you know, with like an MDMA come down, that may be some level of serotonin depletion. I'm sure there are certain things we could do kind of physically to a brain that would induce states that were, um, were negative. It's just that when you look into the, the kind of actual evidence, we don't see real evidence for kind of spontaneous genetic causes of kind of serotonin imbalance causing depression. These are the kinds of models that the dominant system likes and that, that are good for making money for things like SSRIs, but we just don't see the evidence for it. it. It seems that our suffering is far more tied up with kind of 
vast systems level trends of how we learn to live in the world. So, you know, it, it doesn't even have to be necessarily, you know, we're talking more on the nurture side here, more in terms of experience, rather than it just being in your nature to be depressed. Uh, but it doesn't even have to be in your lifetime. You could, if you come from a kind of a lineage, a family where people have had lots of stress um, and have had to struggle, we know that gets passed on epigenetically. So that gets, your DNA will be kind of carrying that signal that it's not okay to be at peace in the world. And I see stress as the fundamental axis here through to kind of feeling safe and at peace in the world versus feeling overstressed and defeated and a sense of helplessness and depression at the other end. Um, so usually there's, yeah, there's some inner work will lead to an understanding. It's, I can't really imagine what it would be like to, you know, say someone underwent psychedelic psychotherapy and they intentionally moved towards their kind of, their feelings of depression. And usually what would happen is associations would come up, you know, important life events, there'd be some cathartic release of emotion if there was no underlying cause, what would happen in someone like that would be there would just be a kind of blank. They would just be there with this awful feeling and there would be nowhere to go with it. I've never heard of that happening. I can't really imagine that happening. That would be quite a, um, a chilling thing, I think, to come across, a kind of dead end in your own mind that your suffering has no underlying reason. Suffering is, is I think, is one of the most fundamental aspects of, of the life process is what guides us to kind of keep um to keep surviving you know this is part of my living mirror theory i think feeling comes in at the very first kind of phase of life and suffering is part of that um so i don't think you know it's there to guide us it's there for insight and for navigating the world and if there are dead ends in our own mind like that that's just not how i understand the mind is as working and i'd be yeah, it'd be quite um, unfortunate if that were the case, I think. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, you mentioned also what's the evolutionary purpose of feeling depression in this case. So if there was no underlying cause in that case, there couldn't really, I don't think there could be a functional adaptation if you just had certain members of the population who were genetically depressed. Um, you would think that would be selected against. But I think evolutionarily depression you know, can, it can be a, what we think of as depression, if you think of it in the context of grieving, where you're, you're feeling, you're in a mode of transition where you have to kind of withdraw energy from the world and give your models of the world time to update. So say you've lost someone who's, who's really close to you and you really depended on, it's not really safe for you to just go out with high energy back into the world and re-engage because you've lost a huge component of your sense of self um, that as it extends into other people. And you need time for your brain to reconfigure and learn how are you going to adapt, you know. So it makes sense that you kind of take off the the steam of, um, take off the gas of, of how you kind of are motivated to go out into the world and do things. Um, so depression itself can have that kind of evolutionary purpose. And also, if you're, you know, I find the paradigm of learned helplessness a really useful one for understanding aspects of depression. If you were... If you were lost in a desert and you you tried everything you could to um, to find you know water or food or civilization or any safety and you and you were utterly defeated by it and there was nowhere to go, the best strategy probably would be to lower your metabolism, move as little as possible, give up kind of the immediate hope of trying to find options and just see if you can just eke out survival long enough that maybe your circumstances will change someone will come across you and you'll get lucky so you giving up hope in that situation is actually what you need because hope will keep you <laughs> exciting energy you know so there's this there's this coupling between our with depression and how much we and, you know depression makes us retreat from the world so it's very much tied up with motivation um so i think it has adaptive functions in that in that case um sam also says can i recommend other youtube channels or podcasts yeah so more and more um, I used to listen to a lot of podcasts now. It's more kind of audiobooks if I'm listening to stuff. But um, yeah, so there are, there are a few. I mean, I originally, so there's, there's the Be Here Now network where you, there's a lot of kind of old talks from people like Ram Dass and I think they just really stay, um, an Alan Watts one. 
Uh, Judith Goldstein has a lot of his Dharma talks on there. I think it's called Insights Hour, his one about Vipassana meditation. That's a great kind of library of uh, lots of teachers that um, I really respect. Um, there's also uh, Lama Surya Das as well, has got a, uh, I think it's called Enlightenment Now, which is um, another great kind of one about meditation in the kind of Adriana tradition. And then more recently, you know, so Charles Eisenstein, who's a guest I've had on before, he's got a, a podcast, I think, called A New and Ancient Story. He has one interesting guest, talks about uh, some of the kind of themes that I talk about here, but a lot on the kind of social ecology kind of side. Um, there's a, a podcast called Consciousness Live from a philosopher called Richard Brown, who kind of interviews leading thinkers on consciousness. And recently I started listening to Michael Taft's uh, Deconstructing Yourself, which again, a lot to do with kind of meditation and um, related areas. Oh, and there's also the Bioneers Conference. They have a podcast. Um, I think it's just called Bioneers. And they have great talks on, again, more in the kind of area of ecology and um, creating a sustainable society and uh, indigenous rights, stuff like that, uh, land rights. Yeah, that's a really good um, podcast as well. And then Sam has another question, which I think came in last week. I didn't get a chance to answer it. Um, he says, when it comes to your approach to psychedelic healing, uh, would you still employ the same approach with ayahuasca? In your video, you recommend uh, a medium dose, but my understanding is that ayahuasca ten doses tend to be higher. Uh, would you approach an ayahuasca experience in the same way as the cyber LSD? Thank you. So yeah, I think Sam's referring to a video or a podcast episode I did a while back called My Approach to Psychedelic Healing. Um, yeah, you also use the word recommend. I'll uh, reiterate here that I'm not recommending anyone do anything. I'm sharing my own experience of what I found useful uh, because I wished this information was out there when I when I did this stuff, but I, I can't uh, recommend explicitly that people, you know, uh, do what I did because it's, it's incredibly intense, hard work, and you can't know who's, you know, suited to it. But uh, yeah, I'm happy to share my own personal experience. And for me, it was, I was doing kind of somatic, kind of tension releasing um, body work. So this was particularly uh, using David Baselli's trauma release exercises. I did a podcast episode with him as well, uh, with this kind of hip shaking and tremoring, which I found to be kind of revolutionary. That was, that was really the answer to me to kind of fully surrender to the experience in a way that released kind of stress related to emotional traumas. And yeah, so the, the, with that approach, I was typically using around 150 micrograms of LSD, um, sometimes up to the kind of 200, maybe occasionally 300, but there wouldn't usually be a reason to go that high. You know, it was medium dose, even micro doses, micro doses were very helpful as well. So it's a real kind of continuum here where it's not so much about having big dose experiences where you have these mystical experiences. It's about unlocking, letting the kind of models in your mind that hold on too tightly, especially if it's in a kind of embodied way, letting them relax and learning to kind of release and feel more peace in the world. With ayahuasca, you know, I find LSTs be very clear headed, same with kind of MDMA. And then psilocybin, you get into this more kind of, psilocybin and ayahuasca have this far more organic, feel where it feels like something else is kind of interacting with you um which yeah ayahuasca is a very different experience to me and it's whereas with with lsd it feels like a kind of it feels a bit like kind of drain cleaner like unclogging things in my in my system it feels like a a, a chemical that i can use to yeah to do some deep cleaning with ayahuasca it feels like an entirely other experience that you're not in control of and as a result, all I could do was, you know, you learn in the, the process to, to surrender and relax um, as you do this kind of work. That's the best thing you can do with ayahuasca. And for me, if I were to do ayahuasca again, I, did, I didn't do exceptionally high dose. I did a kind of the usual medium to high dose, but I, I would go maybe a bit higher next time. I'd, you know, because I see it as kind of you're throwing yourself into this experience and the experience unfolds the way it's going to unfold and you get whatever insights you get. So you're not directing it as much. So there is a slight, a slight difference there. Um, 
Okay, and then we have a next question from Aksh. Uh, they say, hi, James. I realize the, these are multiple questions, but they sort of resolve around the same theme, in my opinion. How can we know or map what we truly want to do with our life so that there is least amount of regret near the end of one's life? Can we be truly aware of our motivation for wanting something? Or do you think there could be parallel motivations for wanting something? That is to say, motivation emerging from the healthy parts of us and partly from the shadow parts of us at the same time. How does one balance the act of honoring the deepest wants in oneself and giving back to the world when we see more and more people suffering around us? Thanks. Yeah, that's a complex question. So um, when, I mean, I've, when I think of kind of what I've chosen to kind of dedicate my life to, I've been lucky that I've, I've, I've had a sense of what I'm interested in, what I think is valuable. And I followed that and I've been able to make a career in it. And so it feels, it's been fairly straightforward, I think I would say for me to know what's, what I really want um, and what's coming from a kind of a healthy place uh, in that sense, in that very simple sense. Um, but I think, you know, and also other people, you know, a, a, a contrast to that might be someone who yeah, I think in, a, in the previous generation, we saw a lot of people who bought into the, the the narrative that if you meet all of the kind of societal expectations of having a family and a house in the suburbs and a high salary and all this stuff, you'll then you'll be happy. And then it's now a kind of a, a cliche because people are aware, I think, that, or at least maybe, you know, if there's enough people still chasing that, and maybe not everyone is aware, that happiness doesn't come from the accumulation of material goods and meetings, you know, certain expectations that come from outside yourself. So in that case, people I think are being driven by shadow issues, by kind of unconscious emotional issues of wanting approval, wanting understandable issues, of wanting financial security as well. Um, but the I think the key issue here is whether they're conscious or unconscious. So a huge aspect of all the the work we can do. Um, to improve ourselves is just bringing this shadow material to the surface, making it conscious. So the fact that you're asking this question is a good indicator that you're on the right path. Someone who was making decisions based from out of a kind of unconscious shadow process would be unconscious of it and they would just be reactively chasing whatever it was, whether it's say like with an addiction person, right? Um, if someone doesn't realize they have a problem but they're returning to certain addictive cycles, they're doing that from a place of not seeing what's really going on. If they could see their emotional pain and see what it's really coming from and release that and engage with it and learn to accept it, that's the healing process. And it's synonymous with becoming aware of it. So it's a good sign that you're you know, asking this stuff and um, really you're the only one who can figure out this stuff at the end of the day. You know, people can help in the kind of the process of, of learning where there are kind of emotional issues that are unresolved that are leading to certain desires but ultimately you're you know it's a process of learning to discriminate within yourself you know getting familiar with your own mind knowing what your story is um because it's not obvious you know we, we come into adulthood and we actually don't really know <laughs> what our story is until we retell it to ourselves till we look into our own minds see what happened in our life so far and potentially in previous generations and then reconstruct our own story um, so yeah, it's, I think there can be parallel motivations. There can be, you know, uh, so something, you know, that I have experienced is when, if you feel there's something you want to do, but you're being kind of hooked by other people's kind of emotionally manipulative dynamics that can create tension as to, you may, you may end up doing things that are not aligned with your own interests, but you're doing it because of some um, unhealed part of yourself that has, that, it, that those kind of dynamics are tapping into. Um, people, you know, staying in damaging relationships and they can't get out, even though it's awful for the people involved. These are examples of people kind of being trapped in unconscious patterns where they might, you know, here you really do have parallel motivations. You can have someone who really wants to leave consciously but actually part of them doesn't want to because they're, they're not leaving. So there's clearly some unconscious part that's stuck in that dynamic. Um, but yeah, so literally just 
doing this kind of inner work and learning what your patterns are is the only is the only real answer. Um, but it sounds like you're on the right track. Uh, and then the final bit was how does one balance the act of honoring the deepest part, deepest ones in oneself and giving back to the world? Yeah, I think I, so for me, I noticed a dynamic where my pro-social instincts, my, you know, when I was, when I was younger, you know, a lot of us have this desire to like, to save the world effectively, to kind of, you know, do what we can to reduce suffering as much as possible. And some of us can take on that feeling where it really feels like it's our burden and we we need to, we are the ones who needs to, need to, to solve it. For myself, I felt, I came to feel that that was um, a reflection of, again, an unhealed dynamic of feeling like I couldn't protect myself when I was young and so there's a projection thing where it's like I have to instead of working on myself and looking inwards I need to try and help others because they're like a reflection of me so that that's coming from a kind of unhealed place and that's not ideal because you know there would probably be burnout or you would you could end up not helping if you're actually doing it to satisfy your own needs instead of helping others so I I tend to take um the the view that it's really important that we do this inner work that that really needs to come first and the kind of person who is self-sacrificial self-negating and wants to save others ahead of themselves usually the kind of work they have to do is learning to to res respect their needs and their boundaries and their wants and their desires um so for that kind of person i would say yeah like you should you should really lean on the side of um turning i mean for everyone i think you should lean on the side of turning inwards and uh, and learning, coming to feel at peace in yourself so then you can be as effective as possible in the world. You have to kind of trust that when you turn inwards and you do this work, you're not just going to uh, give up on the rest of the world. And, you know, when you, when you find a sense of peace in yourself and you move into these kinds of mystical states where you feel yourself to be reflected of the same process, same thing as everyone else, there's still this, I mean, greater than ever, there's a desire for flourishing in the whole system, flourishing for everyone in the world. Um, there can be a loss of that um, obsessive, manic need to go and put out all the fires in the world. Uh, and you could argue that leads you to, to being less useful, less focus on, on others. But my instinct is that we don't want people running around again acting from this unconscious neurotic place you know uh, someone was telling me how they were involved with uh, Extinction Rebellion in London and they were in the offices there and it was just so chaotic and emotionally draining and just full of people with unresolved issues and it just made it unworkable as a as a environment to work in and that really that anecdote really fits with my instinct here that like you know if we want to help others, it seems a bit kind of strange to advocate turning inwards instead of continuing to kind of run around and, and just focus on, on others. But my honest opinion is if we're going to have any kind of sustainable big impact in the world, it really needs to have this solid foundation of, of the people involved knowing their own issues. And this work doesn't take, a, you know, in a sense, it takes a lifetime in, in a small sense, but... You can really get to grips with the broad strokes of your dynamics in a relatively short period of time. You know, a few years of psychotherapy, a few trips even, you know, psychedelics. Um, we're not talking about retreating from the world for the rest of your life and being unhelpful. Um, yeah. So thank you for the questions. Uh, these are twice a month. And as I mentioned at the start, you can leave questions on Patreon or on the YouTube channel. Until next time.